So we're making progress. Um, isn't it possible that our paranoia is going to maybe get us in trouble? No, in fact, we don't have a fraction of the paranoia we actually need. I, <laughs> I, I don't like being the guy saying that. I am, in my heart, the ultra champion of science as the mechanism uh, through which we come to, to progress. But science as it is currently instantiated is so broken and so corrupt that, look, I hear you saying things that I absolutely would have said not that long ago. But unfortunately, the evidence is right in front of you that this can't possibly be the world you actually live in. Where is the biology department or medical school in the United States that stood up and put out a statement that said something like, we are sympathetic to people who struggle with profound gender dysphoria. However, biologically speaking, there are only two sexes. That has nothing to do with human beings. That's a pattern that goes back evolutionarily 500 million years at a minimum. I agree. And yeah. it is a mistake to regard this as a medically remediable problem. Okay? We, we support those who wish to live their lives, to dress as they will, to be called as they will, but biologically speaking, the ambiguity in question does not exist. Where is the medical school that said that? That's a great question. That's a great question. I think it's criminal the way some of these, like the St. Louis Children's Hospital behaved in giving eight-year-olds puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, rendering them sterile. I think, it's, I think it, is, it is the worst form of child abuse I can think of and you're right. When the CDC has drugs that allow a man, a, a man to lactate, from what I hear, I can't even believe that's true. I can't even right. believe it's true. But if, but, but you know, um, this social contagion, this sort of virus, is uh, pervasive. This is, this is, this might though be a separate instance, isn't it? Let's, let's assume. Let's assume it is. It's an yeah. anomaly. There's something about that topic which distorts reality, and we can't get it right. Okay. Yeah. Well, then what do you do with the entire medical establishment with respect to mRNA COVID vaccines? Where's the medical school that stood up and said, hey, wait a minute, maybe these things are the solution to the pandemic, but they couldn't possibly be safe. We don't know enough about them for anyone to tell you that they're safe. And frankly, human beings have a God-given right to informed consent. We established that at Nuremberg. We hung seven doctors for violating informed consent. Maybe you should take these shots, but you at least need to know. There's no one on earth who could tell you they're safe because they're too new. Where's that medical school? The, the, my, my, again, w for me, what I always go to is Occam's razor. I kind of say, look, um, we had this, this COVID, this disease. People were dying because they were being intubated. You know, uh, So a lot of old people were dying because we didn't quite know how to – most of it, it was sort of hit us, and we didn't know exactly how to deal with this in the beginning. There were a lot of errors, a lot of um, – sort of rush to judgment things and we and people died because we treated it the wrong way. I think that hospitals, there was an incentive to mark people who died because they got COVID. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, but it's not um, it's not an absolutely. It's way worse than you're portraying it. I can imagine mm -hmm. massive errors. That's happened before. Yeah. What you've got is I mean, what happened to the doctors who did stand up and say they got what, a big no, trouble. They, yeah. They, st they lost licenses. They were driven out of their professions. They yep. were slandered. Doctors at the absolute top of their field were slandered as if they were cranks. Heather and I, for just simply taking an evolutionary toolkit and saying, hey, wait a minute, what is COVID? Where did it come from? What are these drugs? Do they work? What is this remedy we're being told is the route out of the pandemic? What are its likely effects? How much do we know about its safety? For doing that... Heather and I had our family income slashed in half by YouTube. They demonetized us yep. for saying things that are now clearly true. And guess what? We're still demonetized. That's right. Okay? That's we right. don't have medical schools standing up and saying, hey, wait a minute. We really screwed up with those mRNA vaccines. We told you they were safe. They weren't. They couldn't have been. They could have been 
harmless. They still wouldn't have been safe because safe means not without harm. It means without risk. And there was a risk. Even if those shots had been inert, we wouldn't have known they were safe for decades. You would have had to have a control group and you would have had to have a treatment group and you would have had to follow them for decades to know that that technology was safe. So they just flat out lied to us. And the point is, we know why they did it, or we at least know what their cover story is. Let's grant them their cover story. The cover story is we didn't want to create hesitancy, so we engaged in a noble lie. And my point is, well, guess what? You violated my right to informed consent at the point you decided you were entitled to lie to me over this stuff. That's a hanging offense. We haven't hung yeah. anybody. We haven't even forced them to admit they made a mistake. Right. We still got these things on the market. So I guess my point is not about COVID. I agree with all that, by the way. Right. I agree with okay. everything you just said. It's very um, reasonable stuff. But the question is, having seen those malfeasance over COVID and knowing that similar levels of uh, ghastly harm have been done in the name of gender transition to children, no less, why do you have faith that this system is about progress, that it it's not capable of spotting the most grotesque and obvious sorts of harm. So let me tell you, let, let, me, let me answer that. Um, the, the same reason I think the technology in my car seems to be getting better, cars are safer, burning cleaner, um, my phone works, the food grid works. So a lot of society does work. We know that sanitation and nutrition are a big part of uh, longevity as well, exercise. The information's out there. I think there are a lot of people, and for that matter, the entire the entire grid seems to at least be interested in solving problems and moving us forward. I do think we are making scientific progress. I think we are coming up with drugs, for example, that will help you build muscle faster with fewer side effects. We're, we're coming up with um, uh, different kinds of therapies if you do get cancer. So I, I, I think it's unfair to the progress we've been making to say that it's all, is it a profit motive? Yes. Um, did was was COVID a huge cover up? You could make the argument, but I I, I always look at the sort of big picture. I, I don't know any children that have died of diphtheria, of uh, been sterile from mumps, uh, rubella, all the uh, whooping cough, uh, tetanus, smallpox. If you if you read literature itself, forget the scientific record, you know that you know. Everybody died when they were young. I mean, Lincoln lost his four children. Mary Todd went crazy as a result. We don't deal with that stuff anymore. And, and credit must be given at least to the fact that vaccines, along with nutrition, along with sanitation, along with antibiotics, along with surgery, uh, along with anesthesia, by the way, if you like the good old days, would you like to be born before anesthesia or after anesthesia? Try setting a bone without that. So, so I always look at, I, I, maybe I'm just a guy who looks at what we've done and I tend to be um, hypnotized by the progress we've made and the progress I'm counting on, which I think is down the pipe. So, so, so maybe I'm saying I feel like if we're going to attribute it all to corruption and to um, a conspiracy for money or whatever it might be, I think we, I think we better be very careful of that. I, I think demonizing and punishing the pharmaceutical industry could bite us in the ass. That that maybe that's what I'm trying to say. And you you seem to be generally generally unaccepting of any of. Um, that. Let's put it this way: I think all I did was take the red pill, and <laughs> I think I've looked at the matrix, and it's a pretty ugly picture. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not that I don't resonate with what you're saying. I want to live in the world that you're describing. I just don't think I live there. And, you know, you say it could bite us in the ass if we view pharma with too much cynicism. In light of what pharma has done, I do not believe there is a level of too much cynicism with respect to the harm they are willing to do. I, I have looked that monster in the eye. I'm not saying we don't need a pharmaceutical industry. But the company is the, – there's a principle that – I use as an evolutionary biologist, and that's that's my core competence. The niche defines the creature, right? You provide a niche, you give enough time, you end up with the creature you ordered. And the niche for the pharmaceutical industry has created corporate monsters that 
view our health paradoxically. When we are healthy, they are not highly profitable. Now, I know how this sounds. I fully understand that I sound like a crazy person. On the other hand, how did I end up crazy? Well, you mentioned, I don't know if we were recording yet, but you mentioned at the beginning uh, my work on telomeres. And I won't go into too much detail unless you want to, but for the moment, let's just say I was working on an interesting evolutionary model that I had no idea had any medical implications whatsoever. In fact, I thought that the implication of the model was that there was very little to do about human aging with respect to the uh, greatest longevity. You know, people at a maximum live something like 120 years. That number has not budged. Our average longevity has skyrocketed. There's lots to do about our average longevity. We can be younger, longer, but are we going to live past 120? No, I was pretty sure there was nothing to be done there. So I thought I was just working on a, an analytical project. The obstacle to it, the obstacle to completing it, was that there was one fact which wrecked the entire model I was constructing. And the fact involved something called telomeres, which are repetitive genetic sequences at the end of each of our chromosomes, or both ends of each of our chromosomes. The number of repeated sequences seems to be connected to how many times a cell can reproduce. So every time a cell duplicates itself, it loses a little bit of that repetitive sequence at the end of the, at the, end of the chromosome, or each chromosome. And that seemed to be a mechanism that evolved to prevent us from getting cancer. So when a cell just starts reproducing and doesn't listen to the signals that it should stop, it runs into a limit where it can't reproduce anymore. And that In other words, if you want to get older, you got to, you got, yeah, getting older comes at a, at a cost. At you, a cost. You might, you're not going to get cancer, but you're going to get older. Entropy right. Takes over. Yeah. The, the limit that prevents us from being overrun by cancers causes us not to be able to permanently just replace our cells forever. So that just seemed like an elegant system. And the one fact that would not fit with that model was that mice were well understood to have ultra long telomeres, like many times the length of a human telomere. And yet they had very short lives. And I struggled with that fact because I knew the model had to be right because so many things fell into place if it was right. And this one fact was just so completely inconsistent with it that I couldn't make heads or tails of it. To make a long story short, I ultimately started thinking radically enough to find the answer. And I wasn't in a position to test it because I was a theoretical biologist and not a, a, a lab scientist. But I hypothesized that the long telomeres that were understood to be a feature of mice or maybe even a feature of all rodents, of which there are 2,000 species, I realized that that was likely to be an artifact of the laboratory environment in which the animals were bred and not a feature of the wild animals from which they were derived. Right. So there's a difference in domesticated mice and wild mice. Right. So yeah. this was a very radical hypothesis. And I called up somebody whose work I had been reading, somebody with, for whom I had a lot of respect, Carol Greider. And I said, you don't know me. I'm a grad student at the University of Michigan, an evolutionary biologist. I've been reading your work and I have a question for you. She was very nice. I said, Carol, is it possible that mice don't have long telomeres, uh, that only lab mice do, and that wild mice have short telomeres? And she said, huh, I don't think that's likely to be true, but here's an interesting fact. If instead of ordering mus musculus, you order mus spritus from Europe, the length of the telomeres varies substantially by your supplier. And what that meant was there's some reason to think that these, lab these breeding environments are having some sort of an effect. And then she said about testing that hypothesis. She and her graduate student, Mike Heeman, got a bunch of strains of mice that had only been captive for a short period of time, and they measured their telomeres. And I got the most exciting email of my life. Came back and said, the hypothesis is true. Wild mice have short telomeres. Holy smokes. Now, why do I tell that story in describing how I ended up 
uh, as troubled by science and medicine as I am today. Because what unfolded next was I was very excited because I knew my evolutionary hypothesis was on solid ground and I wanted to publish it. And I asked Carol, where are you going to publish this result so I can cite it in my paper? And she said something to me that rings in my ears still, something I was too young and naive to understand. She said, actually, we're not going to publish it. We're going to keep it in-house. And I did not understand how that could possibly be true because she had just found something so profoundly important that we needed to know because we were now breeding mice that were clearly a bad model for all sorts of things. If they had these ultra-long telomeres and telomeres were playing a balancing role between cancer and tissue repair, this was an urgent problem. And I knew how urgent it was because it had implications for some pharmaceutical safety testing. If you have animals that have really long telomeres, then they can repair any damage you cause, right? Anything that doesn't flat out kill them uh, is something that you can repair because they can repair, they can replace their tissues indefinitely. Right. So what that meant was that our whole drug safety system was built on a foundation that was rotten to the core. 